the basics of the MIPS ISA and we talked about the data types. I just remind you there are four uh, data types, byte, half word, word and double word. And so the double word instructions are relevant only in a 64 bit ISA. And 32 bit ISA will only have up to, th up to 32 bit instructions, up to word. Integers are two component, floating points, single and double position. These are the uh, registers that MIPS had, just to remind you quickly. It has 32 32-bit 32 integer registers, one of which is hardware to zero. It has 32-bit floating point registers, two of which are paired to get double precision when you need. Other than that, you have program counter, which is implemented by four. Um, on sequential instructions, meaning that your instructions are 32 bits in size. Okay. There are two special registers, high and low, for storing multiply divide results. And, and this is how you pair up the floating point registers. And we looked at ALU instructions, which have classic three operand format, that is two sources and one destination. And so we looked at several other examples. This is pretty much what it is. You can go and look at the C file that I posted okay. that actually lists what exactly this instruction does. Okay. All right. so, um, so if you have any confusion, it's written in C, not in English, so there should not be any ambiguity. Okay. That, oh, what does this sentence mean exactly? Okay. There should not be anything like that. It's a C statement. You should be able to exactly figure out what it is doing. Okay. All right. So just I just want to highlight a couple of things, especially I mean we talked about this last time also. So if you look at these two instructions, add and add unsigned, okay. And if you if you look at what they do, they do exactly the same thing. There is no difference actually. Okay. The only thing is that we ignore the overflow in one case. Which case? Does anybody remember? In the unsigned case, right? In the unsigned case, we ignore the overflow. In the other case, we actually take the overflow into account and possibly take an exception okay. whenever, if your overflow exceptions are set. That's one thing. The second thing is that when you look at the immediate instructions, like add immediate, where you know that one of the operands is an immediate value. Right? Like here it is 100. Okay. So in this case, in the immediate instructions, so there are again two variants, add immediate and add immediate unsigned. In both cases, this particular immediate value will be signed extended. Okay. All right. So essentially, what it means is that again, the only difference between add i and add i u is that in the unsigned case we go to overflow, okay. but in both cases the immediate constant will be signed extended. All right. Unsigned case one is signed, one is unsigned. No, 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 no. You can you can specify a negative number here in add unsigned. Yes, that's fine. Okay. It will be sign extended. So the only so that this this is somewhat confusing, but keep this in mind. Is the only difference is that in one case we ignore the outflow, in the other case we don't. Okay. It has nothing to do with the sign extension actually. In both cases we'll be doing a sign extension. Okay. Alright? So it set less than immediate is essentially a comparison. It is checking whether <coughs> dollar two is less than hundred or not. So in this case hundred will be treated as a sign number. Okay. So if you specify a negative number here, it will be taken as a negative number. But if you specify a negative number here, it will be sign extended to get a 32-bit opponent. But then the whole 32-bit thing will be treated as an unsigned large number. Okay. Right. So keep that in mind. Okay. So, so again, yeah. So why are we doing a sign extension, zero extension? Because of course, this is a 32-bit opponent. To be able to do the operation, I need to extend this to a 32-bit opponent. Okay. But usually this is going to be less than 32 because this is going to be part of your instruction which is itself is 32 bits. So clearly this is going to be smaller than 32 bits. Okay. Right. And um, mult and mult unsigned. So again the same difference. So keep this in mind. Arithmetic instructions all unsigned and signed difference is that you don't know for in one case. Okay. So here the result goes to two specific registers low and high. In case of division, quotient goes to low, remainder goes to high. Okay, all right. And then you have two instructions to move from high and to move from low. 
So that, so for example, this construction will copy high into dollar four. Okay. So now you can actually do conventional arithmetic on the result of your portion. I'm sorry, result of your division or multiplication. Okay. Because low and high do not, you are not allowed to use low and high in any other arithmetic instruction as an operator. Okay. So clearly, you have to bring it first to the general purpose register, and then only you can use that. Any question on this left side, the left column, the arithmetic column? So this is pretty much it actually. So um, I might have missed out a few, one or two here and there. You can look up the C file. Okay. You'll have the exhaustive list of all arithmetic instructions. Okay. So on the logical side, there really isn't much to explain. The, the mnemonics are self-explanatory, and or exon, nor and immediate. Again, here we'll be doing zero extension. Okay, in all logical operations. So these are not sign extended. These are actually zero extended. Right. Or immediate, XOR immediate, shift right logical, shift right logical, shift right arithmetic. This one we discussed last time. Essentially, this means that you shift dollar two uh, to the right by ten positions while shifting in the sign bit. Okay, instead of shifting in zeros. All right. Shift left logical variable. This one has a special property that whatever you mention in dollar one. So dollar one is a shift amount. Okay, by how much I took shift? It will only take the lower five bits because the maximum shift amount cannot be more than cannot be more than cannot be more than thirty two exactly. So it will pick up only the lower five bits okay, in dollar one and ignore everything else. You can you can specify a very large number in dollar one. It's, it's going to ignore everything but the last five bits. The last thing is five bits. Okay. Uh, same for uh, shift right logical var variable, shift right arithmetic variable. Um, Louis, uh, this one is used to um, only affect, actually it affects the whole register, but what it does is that it puts 40 in the lower, in the upper 16 bits and zeros out the lower 16 bits okay. in dollar 3. So essentially this one stands for load upper integrate. Right. So we'll see the practical application of this. Can anybody guess how I might want to use UI? What could be a good application for that? Can you guess about that? How do I load a constant in your register? So I want to operate on a constant. What are the options do I have? Suppose I want to do the operation x plus c where c is a constant. You see the constant known at compiler. So essentially I have this kind of a program. As defined C, some value here, and then somewhere in the program I say y equal to x plus c. So compiler knows the value of c. So what are the options do I have? How do I compile this instruction? Yes? Yeah? How do I compile this instruction? Can we be add immediately? Can we? Yes, so that's one option. Why not do it add immediate? That's the obvious one to do. Add immediate. So, so by the way, remember that in most cases, the compiler will generate an add immediate as opposed to add immediate unsigned. Okay? Because it would usually generate an instruction where overflow is actually turned off. Okay? Or for detection is turned off. Okay, so yeah, so the obvious answer is that why why not add immediate? Does anybody see any drawback of using add immediate? So essentially, what I'll do is I I'll uh, put x in the register. Put so let's let's let us be explicit on that. So I'll pro precisely say r1 gets x, and uh, let's suppose that y is allocated in r2. Uh, then I'll generate add i. Sorry, uh, following the loops. Uh, some the, the value of C, right? Does anybody see any problem with this? Can I do this all the time? The value of C should be, should be? Will be less in this case. Should be what? Um, should, should be less in this case. Should be less in this case? Uh, because the instruction is of 32. Right. 
and the opcode and other opcode will take some Right, right, and, right. Uh, for C, there will be limited. Right, exactly. So when I when I um, when the designers came up with MIPS encoding, they would have allocated some fixed number of bits for encoding an immediate value. Okay, right. So C should be within that range. Like for example, if I say when my immediate value cannot, I mean sorry, immediate values encoding 16 bits, then C better be not more than to be 16 minus one. So that's the largest value I can represent. So clearly there is a limitation. What do I do if C is larger than that? What options do I have? How do I compile this? Does everybody, does everybody follow what I'm trying to say? Why add I has a problem when C is large? Right? Okay, but I cannot of course impose a constraint on my high level language program saying that oh we are compiling for an architecture for which a constant can be only this much. That's a nonsense logic, right? So there are other ways to compile it for, for large constants. How do you do that? So what other options do I have? So add i for small constants. What else? Assign a dedicated trace to Okay, and? Keep it allocated throughout? No, what do you mean by that? Assign dedicated registers in this one. That list will contain only that constant. How does it get that value? How do you bring that value with that register? Right? You load it. And so whenever you need it, you bring it from there. So essentially what you're suggesting is that allocate C in memory, right? Okay, and whenever you need the value from memory, use a load instruction uh, from memory to the register. Is that what you're suggesting? No, okay. But anyway, that's an option. Let me just list it here. Load from memory. Okay, what you're saying? Keep it in that register. No, how does the register get the value? That is the question, right? It should be one time load and then use that register. One time load, okay. All right. So, so it, this is what you're saying. Essentially, you load from memory. What you're saying is that I will pin that register forever. Okay, right? Um, so um, maybe you will learn in your compiler course that it's not a very good idea all the time. Okay. Because essentially what you're doing is this constant may be used in some localized places in the program, but you are pinning it for the entire life of the program, which constraints are compiler in allocating the instance. What else can I do? Load from memory is a costly operation actually. Memory is slow. So this is often called interpreting a constant at runtime. Okay, this particular operation. Even if you know it at compile time, you are actually generating a constant from memory, which is a very, very, very big bad solution. What else can I do? Can I use the auto increment C times? There is no auto increment instruction here in this list. Suppose we can use two instructions instead of one for generating this concept. But no memory operation. Can you do that? How? How do I do that? First of all, load that 16 bits. Which 16 bits? From this uh, constant C. Which 16 bits? Upper 16 bits. Upper 16 bits of C. Yeah. Okay. Which the compiler can shift, calculate the compiler. Again, that shift. Uh, shift? Shift mm -hmm. that uh, 16 times and then again load. Uh, no, what do you shift by 16 times? That the value of C, it will be some 32 bits. Yes. Okay. okay. So, first of all, load 16 bits. So, let's take an example. Suppose C is, um, suppose C is um, 0x1234567857. It's a 32 bit constant. Okay. Then? So first of all, load the 16, upper 16. What, are, what is that? 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. okay. So and I'll say Louis, let's say dollar 1, 0x, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? Yeah. And uh, then dollar 2. Dollar 1, keep dollar 1. Okay. Then uh, shift it. Uh, uh, six, 16 bits. Shift who? Shift what? Shift that uh, C. Shift C. Okay, yeah. 
Okay, so you what are you trying to do? You're trying to get the lower 60 degrees? Yeah. Okay. All right, and then do what? Do what? We can get the lower 60 degrees. I want dollar one to contain C. Right? So first you get the lower bits and then shift right and then put the. Can you give the instruction sequence example? So here you can get 0x, 5, 6, 7, and. When? Uh, right. No, no, wait, wait, what is the instruction? You have to pick one from this list. Be very, very, very specific. SRL. SLL. Sir, sir, RL. SRL. What are you shifting? Uh, what is the shift amount? What is dollar two? Dollar two is? Is dollar one. So after doing, yes. Okay, I'll put an SLL. Okay, let's see what you're saying. SLL. RL. Oh, sorry, yes, RL. Yeah. SRL. And I'll say dollar one. Dollar one. Uh, no, sir. So here we'll. Okay. So here, dollar one again and then. Dollar one, dollar one. Sixteen. Sixteen. That will have us. No, so it will be the bit small bit. bit so. Sorry. Four. 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 Double zero, double zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, let's go one by one. What is the content of dollar one after this instruction? One, two, three, four, garbage. No. Zero, 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 zero. One, two, three, four, zero, 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 zero. Right? This is dollar one. Now I shift it by 16 bits. What do I get? You get zero, zero, zero. That's dollar one is. Okay, then what do you say? Again, okay. Again, zero, 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 zero. I want this value, remember that, okay? Sorry? First of all, loads uh, C into some register. How? Oh. So that's what I'm trying to do. Actually. All 32 bits from memory we can once. No, once we have to use it. No, why, why do you want to do that? The first time. Why? For, for what purpose? Compiler knows the constant. So it can extract any arbitrary bit from C at compile time. You can do that. I only want to generate the code to make sure that if I want C to be in a register, I have that. So that I can compile this particular statement, y equal to x plus c. So you can load rest of the bits in other register? Any other register? The rest of the bits? In any other register. How do I do that? Louis dollar two and the rest of the values. I guess opposite. Louis dollar one zero x one two three four will give you this particular content. Okay. Can you do a shift? Shift what? How do I get 5, 6, 7, 8? We plugged do, in here. We do two shifts. First, left, and then do You load 5, 6, 7, 8 in other register? Different register. LUI, dollar 2, then that's 5, 6, 7, 8. That will give you uh, 5, 6, 7, 8. Then you shift this 5, 6, 7, 8 to 16 bits. Okay, and then? And then you do logical R. Then I do what? R. Can I? Does anybody follow what, what he's saying? So he's saying, okay, I'll let me write it down. We'll then optimize it.
Is that what you're suggesting? Can we optimize it? So we do a GUI first instruction and then do a add five six seven eight add dollar one dollar one add dollar one dollar one five six seven eight add immediate you mean? Yes. Sir. Okay. Right? I can do that. Yeah. So I can remove these. Right? That will give me the same outcome. So, what what else can I do? Can I use anything else other than add from this list. This will not be the same. This will not be the same thing, why? Because this is 1, 2, 3, 4 and uh, 5, 6, 7 and the lower bits. So dollar one will have this one at the end of V. And 5, 6, 7, 8 will get added here, right? Right? Can I use anything else other than adding it from this list? We are almost there. Oh. Sorry? Oh. All right. Okay. So this is what a good compiler would generate. Okay. It would avoid invoking the adder because addition is usually not a single cycle operation. Okay. No cycles. But all is an easy operation. You can do it in a single cycle. So this is a, this is the, the, the biggest use of doing loading a large constant in a new be two cycles, or two cycles, or uh, yeah, this will be two cycles. Okay. All right, is it clear you're doing? So we, the size of immediate Louis could be more than the other instructions, or no? This constant will go into the immediate field. The Those same bits. sixteen bits. Okay. Floating point operations. These operate on uh, floating point registers. Uh, supports both uh, single and double positions. There is no hardware zero register, so you have to interpret zero at runtime. IEEE 750 over compliant. Typical instructions: add, sub, mul, div, move, uh, where uh, essentially you move from one floating point register to another. Negate, absolute value. CVT is a precision conversion, so if you want to convert from single position to double position. Essentially, uh, this is used when you're trying to do a type casting in the high-level language. For example, you're type casting a float for double. Compile will generate a CVT instruction in that case, All right. or vice versa. MFC, MTC, move between floating point and integer register. So this C might be a little non-intuitive. Why are they saying move from C and move to C? Okay, right? The reason is that can anybody guess why? What does the C stand for? Because I would have actually expected that it would say move from F and move to F, right? MFA for MTF. What is the C? What is it referring to? Conversion. It's, no, it's not conversion. It is moving from something. That is what the C stands for. Yeah. Not cash. What can you think of? Any other word related to microprocessors starts with C. Catastrophe, what did you say? <laughs> CPU. Well, actually, close. Close. Yeah. Coprocessor. Coprocessor, thank you very much. So, the floating point unit actually was a coprocessor in the early MIPS processors, okay. like the Intel processors as well. It used to come with a separate coprocessor. Okay. So, that's exactly what we said. Move from coprocessor, move to coprocessor. Okay, all right. So, it, the first instruction, the MFC moves from a floating point register to an integer register. Okay. And MTC move from an integer register to a floating point register. All right. And this is again generated whenever you try to do type casting in your high level language. Suppose you are cast, trying to cast uh, an integer value into a float. Okay. The compiler will generate one such instruction. Okay. Malt and div, uh, sorry, mal and div uh, don't use uh, high low registers. Uh, because in this case, the targets are actually floating point registers. So, a floating point mal instruction actually will have a specified target, okay, some floating point register. Okay. Um, the remainder doesn't have a meaning here. So, just 
have a result. Right? When you divide a floating point number by another number, you just get a floating point number. There is nothing like quotient or anything. Right? Any question? So, how do you address this floating point registers? Oh, so, the, so you have uh, names, right? You can name floating point registers. Right? So, uh, right? So, you have this. Floating point general purpose is you can name it. Okay, so that takes care of your integer arithmetic, integer logic, floating point arithmetic. Now we come to the memory side of it. So load store operations, there is only one addressing mode supported. Right? So we looked at 10, right, in the past. So MIP supports exactly one, and that is the displacement addressing mode. Always sign extended. So essentially, um, you have a, so it looks like this, for example. Okay, so you have a base register and you have a displacement. And the displacement is always sign x. So most loads and stores are aligned, except we'll talk about this load ward left, load ward right, LWL, LWR, and similarly store ward left and store ward right. So we'll talk about those. So these are the only exceptions which are non aligned uh, loads and stores. And those four instructions also allow you to actually access. Sub registers, okay, some part of a register while keeping the rest unaffected. Loads are supported for signed and unsigned data. Unsigned loads, zero extend the loaded value. Okay, right. So keep in mind that the signed and unsigned loads are loads differ in this only. That is, once you read the data from memory, whether you sign extend the data or zero extend the data. Right. Displacement is always sign extended. Supports three sizes, byte, half word, and word. Double word is supported in 64 bit IS. So 32 bit IS doesn't have any double word instructions. So byte load, there are two as we, as we, as we have already mentioned. Um, one is load byte signed. Okay, we don't write the sign S here explicitly. And load byte unsigned. Right? So this is what it looks like. It takes um, essentially one source register, one displacement constant, and a target register. The displacement in both cases will be sign extended, okay, all right. so meaning that if you specify a negative displacement, it will be treated as a negative displacement. Okay. It will be subtracted from this actually. All right. And the final value that you load will be sign extended in this case to fill up a 32-bit register, whereas this one will be zero extended. Right. half word load, LH and LHU, um, load half word and load half word unsigned. Word load, load word, there is no unsigned flavor. Why is that? Exactly. So it already returns a 32 bit value. There is nothing to extend actually. Okay. So even if we had a load word unsigned, it wouldn't make a difference. It would be exactly the same. Similarly, we have a byte store. So there is no unsigned version for store. Okay. You want to store a byte. So what you do is you take two source registers. Dollar two will be used as the base register for address which will be added to the displacement. Displacement will be sign extended. And you take the value from $3. You take the least significant byte of $3 and send it to this floating address. All right. Similarly, you have half word store, SH, and word store, SW. All right. So SW would store the entire register $2 at this particular address. So you can, you can exactly figure out how these instructions actually execute in the C file again. Okay. So you can go and look up actually which byte it extracts and all these things. The immediate is not shifted by load store size. So that's very important to understand. Because in many books, you'll find that not, not uh, with respect to MIPS, but in general, they say that this number 27 will actually be multiplied by something before adding to dollar 20. MIPS doesn't do that. Okay. It will just take this displacement as it is, will add it to this base, generate the address, and whatever the address will be used to load and store. Okay. So that's what is mentioned here. The immediate displacement will not be shifted by no store size. Okay. It is just sign extended and added to the base register content. Okay. In addition, you have floating point load store. Uh, for example, you have LF, uh, $F1, $60.22. So these instructions are a little notorious in the sense that it will actually have an integer register source for generating the address and a floating point register target. Okay. So you can imagine a store floating point instruction would actually have a floating point register source and an integer register source. Right? So these actually um, 
interface with the both integer pipeline and the floating point pipeline. So that way they're a little harder to implement. Okay. But otherwise they execute exactly in the same way. This will be sign extended, added to dollar twenty two, get the address, load the value to dollar eighty four. And um, here of course you don't have these unsigned byte, half four, word, all these things. You have only two. One is LF, that is single position load, one is LF dot D, double position load. Depending on that, it will load either 32 bytes from here or 64 bytes from here. Okay. All right? Sorry, so 32 bits and 64 bits. Not bytes. Yeah. Any question on load show? So in some cases, the address is blown at compiler. Okay. Um, happens mostly for statically allocated global variables. So the compiler knows the exact address where it is. Right? So naturally, the question is, why should I have to then interpret the address? Uh, that is, generate the address at runtime, right? So why can't I use it directly? So how do you emulate direct address? So suppose I want to load from address 0x123456. Okay. So this is exactly where GUI comes very, very handy. Okay. So what you do is, you first load the upper 16 bits, that is 0x12. Okay. All right. And then you R with the lower 16 bits. And what you have essentially in $2 is address. So you can sit $0.2, boom. Right? I could save all instruction by using non-zero displacement. I could do also this. Okay. That's also awesome. It's going to be better because it saves one instruction. Alright? Clear? Clear What if the address is 0x7898 C? What is so special about that address? So that essentially what the question is asking you is that can I use the same thing? For this address? The answer must be no. Why is that? So what I'm saying is that I cannot really say Louis dollar two zero x seven eight and Lodo dollar four zero x nine eighty C dollar two. I cannot do that. Why? Displacement is yeah. the limitation for maximum displacement. This is yeah, sixteen bits. Maximum displacement. Nine ABC, right? Sixteen bits. The displacement is 16. I'm sorry, I haven't mentioned that. Uh, we'll come to that, the exact info. Yes. So, mix is a 16 bit immediate value in all cases. So, any constant that goes into the, into the instruction cannot exceed 16 bits. But this is okay, right? 980 is 16 bits. But this is going to be wrong. Why is that? So, this is a problem. Yes? So, 980 will be sign extended. Ah. Okay, thank you. So somebody is paying attention. That's pretty clear. Okay, so yes, 9 ABC. What is the MSB of 9 ABC? The most significant bit. One. One. So remember that displacement is going to be sign extended. So when you sign extend 9 ABC, it will fill up with all ones. So the address that we're going to get will not be this entry. It will be something else. We we'll add up two things. Okay, alright. So you cannot do this. What should you do? What should I do here then? How do I get this done? Can I use this? No? Yes? Is the RI fine? 9 ABC here? Yeah. yeah? Why? Because you are just immediate value. It's not signed. 9 ABC. Yeah. So it has to be extended to get a 32 bit operator. So it's not signed. What is not signed? No, immediate value is not. How do you figure out whether it's signed or not? Or for extended. And of course, I don't have any problem with this one here. Now the problem is here. You shift it shifts to here. Well, I have an immediate value which is 9 ABC here. But this is okay. Why? Zero is standard. Who is zero extended? Why? Why not sign extended? Because this logical operation. Logical operation. Thank you. So logical operation of immediate values are always zero extended. So this scheme is okay. okay. So compiler has to figure out by looking at this address which one can I pick? This one or this one? So in most cases it will be able to pick this one, but in some cases it will probably have to pick this one, depending on the address. Right? So remember that. It cannot really figure out by looking at how big the address is because 78, 
7 ABC is okay actually. Okay. So you cannot just make a comparison by looking at the address range. You have to look at only these 16 bits and ask is the MSB 1 or 0. If it is 1, it will generate this code, otherwise, it will generate this code. Right? Question? So keep this in mind. Arithmetic immediates are sign extended, logical immediates are 0 extended. Okay, now load word left and load word right. So let's try to understand what they do. Uh, let's take this particular uh, example. Of course, this is not legitimate mits okay, because you cannot really mention the address like this. You have to generate the address in some other way so that it fits the displacement uh, mode. Okay, but here, this is just an example. So I'm trying to do something from an address which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7. All right? And it looks like a load operation, and I want some value in the dollar four at the end of it. So let the word containing this byte address be W. So what does that mean? So uh, one two three four five seven, right? So let's see what is the word. We have four bytes and five seven. Five six, five 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 four, five four. So big Indian. So you have five four here, five five here, five six here, five seven here. Right? Extract the bytes contained by W that start from this address. Okay. So you start here. So in this case, it's going to be only one byte. Right? Okay, say extract the bytes contained by W that start from this address. Okay. Put these bytes, in this case just one byte, right, this one, in the upper portion of dollar four and leave the remaining bytes unchanged. Okay. So essentially at the end of this particular instruction, the dollar four will have this byte copied here, remaining three bytes remaining unchanged. Okay. This is load word left. Load word left of dollar. Right. Starting from the address, take the bytes, load word toward the left hand of dollar. Load those bytes toward the left hand of dollar. This is clear to everybody what is doing. So this is the only instruction and well, we have AWR also and double. So these are the only instructions in MIPS that allows you to do unaligned word accesses with an unaligned word access. Okay. Because an aligned word address would have given this address. Okay. Right. That allows you to modify a portion of the register. This is the only instruction. Because everything else would actually override dollar for completely. Okay. It preserves the lower three bytes. Alright? So LWR does exactly the same thing, just in the opposite direction. So let's take this example. It says uh, one, two, three, four, five, A. So let's see what is W in this case. One, two, three, four, five, A. So we have uh, five, nine, five, eight, five, eight. Five, eight is on the B end. Five, nine. 5A, 5B. Right? Okay. This is a word containing this byte address. Okay. Extract the bytes contained by W that end at this address. That end at this address. Okay. So you're looking at these bytes. Three bytes. Okay. Put these bytes, in this case three bytes, in the lower portion of dollar four and leave the remaining bytes, in this case the upper byte, unchanged. Right? So, at the end of the execution, dollar 4 will have these three bytes copied on this side, leaving this one unchanged. Okay? Why are these instructions at all important? And of course, circumstances will generate these instructions. Can anybody think of any use case? Think of 
think about using both of these together. Yes? What if I stitch these two words W? W and W, let, 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 let me name them different. W and W prime. Circular right. Circular right? Circular right. If we are taking these two operations together. Circular right, what is that? So we are circular, uh, circularly shifting bits. Okay, so let's speech W and W prime. Right, so we have fifty four, five, six, seven, B. So if I use these two instructions one after another, right? I will have copied what I have done. So um, I would have copied this portion into dollar four, right? Is that clear to everybody at this? Right? If I use these two instructions one after another, I would have copied those four bytes into dollar four. Why do I have to do it in this way? Is there any other way of doing it? Once you realize that the answer is no, you will immediately see the use of this actually. Variable? It is not variable length. I am just copying a word actually. I am copying a word spanning 57, 58, 59, 5 into a register. That's it. Why can't I use load word in this case? It is not reliable. Yes, exactly. So it is very useful when you want to copy a word from an unaligned address. And these are only going to do it in bits. There is no other way, actually. Okay. All right. And what kind of programs might generate unaligned word accesses? If I ask you to write a C program that compiles into LWL and LWR instructions, can you do that? Use what? Union. Something similar? Yes, maybe. I yeah. mm -hmm. should be able to do by unions. I give you a, suppose I give you a string. I give you a string which is something, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, something, etc. And I want to. What? Sorry, say it. I want to extract some characters from some <coughs> arbitrary places. Okay, the most efficient code would be with these two instructions. So byte will be always aligned. Byte will be? Byte will be one byte aligned. One byte aligned, exactly. Right. So every access will be aligned. Every access will be aligned, exactly. So one way to do that would be to read one byte at a time. Yes. But that will take four instructions to read four bytes. And I can use just two to load four bytes like this. Okay. Yes, of course, you can synthesize it using bytes, one byte at a time. Okay. But this is going to be much more efficient. All right? Okay. So I'll actually, today I'll post on the course on one C program, and of course it's hips disassembly, so you can see actually. Simple C program. Which tries to do something of this. It takes a string and tries to extract some arbitrary characters. <coughs> you see that these three instructions are getting generated. Okay. So what about underlined uh, uh, 16 bit accesses, underlined half words. Um, no, we mm -hmm. cannot do that. We can't do no. We have to we have to load a word and use it. That's not what you are doing. Like for example, if you want to load um, half word 57, 58, mm -hmm. you're going to do that. You load this one and then do a shift to get that. Okay. Any question? Control transfer. So there are jump instructions. Uh, so these are essentially unconditional jumps and procedure calls. Uh, they use the absolute address because the compiler knows that address where you're going. Right? So here by procedure call, I mean direct procedure calls okay. or indirect calls. So MIPS ISA offers um, <coughs> 26 bits to encode the absolute target. Okay. So um, shift this target to left by two bits because your instructions are four byte instructions. So any legitimate PC will have last two bits zero. Okay. 
Okay, so essentially, when you are specifying a branch target, there is a meaning of including those two bits also because they are implicitly zero. So what you do is you specify 26 bits, which can give you a 28 bit target okay, right, by shifting into zeros. And borrow the upper four bits of the next PC, that is PC plus four, to form the complete 32 bit target. So essentially what I'm saying is that suppose at a particular PC, we have a jump instruction. It says jump to some label. Right? Okay. And this, this is a, if this level is known at compile time, that's what we're talking about really here, yeah? unconditional daily jumps. Okay. What it will do is the compiler will do is it will take the label, okay, shift out the lower two bits. Alright, because the lower two bits are always zero for any legitimate program counter. Okay. And then what it will do is it will take 26 bits. 26 bits are allowed only. It cannot be more than that. Okay. Which means there is a span of this label, how far you can jump. There is a limit to that. Okay. So this is how it computes the final target. It takes um, the upper four bits. So 28 bits would be bound to the upper four bits to form a legitimate PC, right? PC is the 32 bits. So it takes the upper four bits from the next PC, PC plus four, and shifts in the target in the lower 28 bits. So the procedure called instruction known as jump and link in, uh, in MIPS, so this is JAG, there's a mnemonic used for procedure call, jump and link, saves a return PC which is PC plus 8, we'll talk about this. Why is PC plus 8 and not PC plus 4, we'll turn this. When you make a procedure call, you should return to the next instruction, right, and start executing. So, it jumps one instruction down, so it comes back at PC plus 8, not PC plus 4. Okay, so when, so any, does, does anybody know why? So it will save some uh, variables, uh, it will save to the return address, so it will take four bytes. It no, 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 we are saying the return address is PC plus 8. Stack will be downwards going. So Sorry? Stack will be downwards going. No, no, it has nothing to do with the stack. I am saying, I am at a JAL instruction, which says JAL level. Okay, alright. And I have a PC here, right? The next instruction is PC plus 4, right? I should be returning here. So my return address should be PC plus 4. But what MIPS does is it says the return address is PC plus 8. So it will uh, save the next instruction counter. That is PC plus 4. And it will also have some uh, return address also. This is the return address. We are not talking about the return value of the function. That will go on the stack of variable. Okay, that's different. We are just trying to figure out where I should resume my execution when the function completes. Okay. And what MIPS does is, it is PC plus 8. It skips over one instruction. PC plus 8 is here, the next one. Well, oh, that's just a name. It is linking with a procedure. Yes, PC plus 4 is already in the pipeline. PC plus 4 is already in the pipeline, okay, so? In the next cycle, PC plus 8 would. Mm -hmm. Next cycle, no. I may take a million cycles to compute that procedure, right? PC plus 8 should not be in the pipeline, right? Should not. You cannot execute PC plus 8. So, you can execute PC plus 4. Already? Yeah. Was the reverse direction or not? <laughs> Okay, I'll give you the answer. Okay, you don't have to guess. I thought if somebody knows. Okay, anyway. So it saves the return address, which is PC plus 8 in a fixed register, which is dollar thirty one. This is this is known as the jump return register. Alright, so um, or often called the link register. Alright, so that's your procedure call instruction. So the, the label is encoded exactly in the same way. Completely in the same way. Okay. So how far can you jump? to the power of 26 instructions, right? So that's my that's my jump span, which is a very large actually span, right? To the power of 26 is what? 64 million instructions I can jump. Okay. Indirect jumps where target is not known, that is procedure return or case switch or procedure call by a function pointer, uses a jump, uses a jump register instruction or jump and link register instruction. So there are two instructions to do that. 
One is JR, another one is JLR. Okay. Um, both take a register operand when the target is found. Right. So, for example, here when you return from a function, right, where you are returning is not known there because you may return to many, many different places depending on from where you are called. So it says JR dollar thirty one. Remember that we use dollar thirty one to save the return address. We will actually take the return address from here. Alright, I will stop here. So next time we will try to demystify this particular thing. Why this is